Today we're shifting our focus to how the body communicates through chemistry. The endocrine system works behind the scenes to regulate everything from growth to metabolism using hormones that act on chemical messengers. While the nervous system reacts in split seconds, the endocrine system is all about long-lasting balance and coordination. As we go through this chapter, think of it as learning how the body's internal chemical conversations keeps you alive and in, in equilibrium. The endocrine system is a network of glands that release hormones into the bloodstream. These hormones travel to target organs and tell them what to do, whether it's to grow, store energy, or handle stress. Compared to nerve impulses, hormones affect at slower but last longer, making them perfect for managing steady long-term processes working side by side with the nervous system. The endocrine system helps maintain homeostasis and allows the body to adapt to changes without losing stability. To keep the body coordinated, cells must constantly communicate. The nervous system does this with fast electrical and chemical signals. While the endocrine system relies on hormones circulating throughout the blood, both systems regulate critical processes like metabolism, reproduction, and behavior. The difference is in timing. Nervous communication acts in milliseconds, while endocrine communication takes minutes or even hours, but lasts much longer. Together, they form the body's dual communication network, ensuring every cell knows its role. Let's compare them directly. The nervous system is built for quick reactions. Think reflexes or muscle movement, while the endocrine system manages slower, long-term activities like growth or mood regulation. Endocrine glands are ductless, meaning they release hormones straight into the bloodstream, unlike exocrine glands that use ducts to secrete substances like sweat or enzymes. Once hormones enter the circulation, they travel widely but only affect target cells and matching receptors. Now that we've compared how the endocrine and nervous system communicate, let's look at the anatomy behind it. The endocrine system includes several major glands, the pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, adrenal, and pineal glands. These are the primary hormone producers. Then there's the organs that are mixed roles like the pancreas, ovaries, testes, and hypothalamus. They serve other functions, but still release hormones. Even beyond that, we have secondary endocrine organs like the heart, kidneys, stomach, and intestines, as well as the liver, skin, bones, and adipose tissue. Each of these tissues sends chemical messages that help fine-tune body functions. Remember, endocrine glands are ductless. They release hormones directly into the bloodstream. That's different from exocrine glands, which use ducts to deliver substances like sweat or digestive enzymes. Once released, hormones travel through the blood to find their target tissue and ensure that even distant parts of the body stay in sync. Hormones are the body's chemical messengers. Each one travels through the bloodstream and acts only on target cells that have the right receptors. Think of it like a lock and key match. Some hormones like adrenaline are water soluble and work quickly on the cell surface. Others such as steroid hormones are lipid soluble and enter cells to directly influence gene activity and create long lasting effects. Hormone levels must be precisely regulated to maintain homeostasis. That's where feedback loops come in. Most hormones operate through a negative feedback, which works like a thermostat. For example, when blood glucose rises, insulin brings it back down. And once balance is restored, insulin slows down. Positive feedback is less common, but more dramatic. Like during childbirth, when oxytocin keeps increasing contractions until delivery, these loop help keep our body in steady balance to no matter what changes occur around us. Let's get oriented with the major players. The primary endocrine glands include the pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, adrenal, and pineal glands. Then there's the other organs with secondary roles like the pancreas, gonads, hearts, and kidneys. Together, they form the interconnected web that maintain balance in nearly every system. Each gland has a specific set of hormones and functions, but they don't work in isolation. The output from one often regulates another, creating a complex feedback network across the body. Now we reach what's often called the master control center. The hypothalamus and pituitary work together to link the nervous and endocrine systems. The hypothalamus receives signals from the brain and sends instructions to the pituitary through the stalk called the infundibulum. The pituitary then releases hormones that influence many other glands. 
like the thyroid and adrenal cortex. Think of the hypothalamus as the CEO and the pituitary as the manager who communicates with all the departments head below. The posterior pituitary is made up of neural tissue, essentially an extension of the hypothalamus. It doesn't make hormones, instead it stores it and releases hormones produced by the hypothalamic neurons. Two main ones are released here, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. Antidiuretic hormone helps the kidneys reabsorb water and maintain blood pressure, while oxytocin promotes uterine contractions during childbirth and milk release during nursing. The anterior pituitary, in contrast, is true glandular tissue. It makes and releases its own hormones under the direction of the hypothalamus. Communication happens through the hypophyseal portal system, a network of small blood vessels that carry releasing and inhibiting hormones directly from the hypothalamus to the pituitary. This design allows precise control, ensuring the right hormones are secreted in response to the body's needs. It also finely tunes systems that adjust to stress, growth, and metabolism. Let's take a closer look at that portal system. Blood flows from the hypothalamus through the capillaries into tiny veins within the infundibulum, then into another capillary bed in the anterior pituitary. This direct route means hypothalamic hormones don't get diluted in the bloodstream. They act fast and act locally. It's an elegant shortcut, which allows the brain to regulate hormone production almost instantly. Here's where we see the pituitary's real power. The anterior lobe produces several hormones, growth hormone for tissue growth, prolactin for milk production, thyroid stimulating hormone, forced thyroid stimulation, adrenocorticotropic hormone for adrenal regulation, follicle stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone for reproductive functions. The posterior lobe releases ADH and oxytocin from the hypothalamus. These hormones have effects on all over the body, from how we grow to how we handle stress. The thyroid gland sits like a butterfly in the front of the neck, just below the larynx. It's filled with special spherical follicles containing colloid, which is a protein-rich substance where thyroid hormones are made. Between these follicles lie parafollicular or C cells, which help regulate calcium. Behind the thyroid are the tiny parathyroid glands, usually four in number, and these are responsible for calcium balance. The thyroid produces two main hormones, T3 and T4, which require iodine for synthesis and are controlled by TSH from the pituitary. They regulate how fast cells use oxygen and energy, your body's metabolic rate. The thyroid also releases calcitonin, which lowers high blood calcium by slowing bone breakdown and promoting calcium storage. It works in opposition to parathyroid hormone, showing how multiple glands can fine-tune a single mineral balance to keep your body in homeostasis. The parathyroid glands are small but crucial. They sit on the back of the thyroid and constantly monitor their blood calcium levels. When calcium drops too low, they release parathyroid hormone, or PTH. This hormone acts in three places. It stimulates osteoclasts in the bone to release calcium, tells the kidneys to reabsorb calcium and help the intestines absorb more by increasing calcitriol production. The adrenal gland sits like a cap on top of the kidneys and has two main parts, the outer adrenal cortex and the inner adrenal medulla. Each part produces every different hormone. The cortex makes steroid hormones that regulate minerals, metabolism, and reproduction, while the medulla releases catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine for the fight or flight response. These glands are highly vascularized, meaning blood flow is rapid, allowing hormones to act throughout the body almost instantly. The adrenal cortex has three zones, each with its distinct duties. The outer zone, or the zona glomerulosa, release aldosterone to control sodium and potassium balance and influence blood pressure. The middle zone, the zona fasciculata, controls cortisol, which manages glucose metabolism and helps the body handle stress. The innermost layer, the zona, the zona reticularis, produces small amounts of androgens, which supplement sex hormones, especially in women after menopause. 
The adrenal medulla is part of the sympathetic nervous system and contains specialized cells called chromaffin cells. When the brain detects stress, it sends a signal directly to these cells, triggering the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. These hormones increase heart rate, open airways, and raise blood glucose to fuel muscles. It's the body's built-in emergency system, allowing us to respond to sudden challenges with speed and strength. Now let's tie it all together. The cortex controls long-term balance, electrolytes, glucose, and mild androgen levels, while the medulla manages rapid stress responses. Aldosterone adjusts fluid volume, cortisol mobilizes energy, and epinephrine fuels the fight or flight states. This dual design allows the adrenal gland to handle both everyday regulation and emergencies. When either system malfunctions, we see disorders like Addison's disease, where hormone production is too low, or Cushing's syndrome, where cortisol levels are too high. Moving higher in the brain, the pineal gland sits behind the thalamus and releases melatonin. Melatonin regulates our circadian rhythms, the internal clock that controls sleep and wake cycles. It's produced more in the dark and supplemented by light which is why blue light at night can disrupt sleep. Besides sleep, melatonin also influences appetite, body temperature, and possibly acts as an antioxidant. When our melatonin rhythm is off, we experience jet lag or insomnia. In males, the testes produces testosterone, the main hormone responsible for male reproductive development, sperm production, and secondary sex characteristics such as deeper voice and muscle growth. The Sertoli cells within the testes also produce inhibin, which controls sperm production by producing FSH secretions. Testosterone levels are tightly regulated through feedback with the hypothalamus and pituitary. In females, the ovary produces estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen shapes secondary sex characteristics and regulates the menstrual cycle, where progesterone prepares the uterus for pregnancy and pain maintains it afterwards. Inhibin, also released by the ovaries, limits FSH release to balance the cycle. These hormones fluctuate rhythmically, creating predictable changes in the body that allow us for reproduction. During pregnancy, the placenta acts as a temporary endocrine organ, producing hormones that support both the mother and the developing fetus. It releases human chorionic gonadotropin, also known as HCG, which maintains the corpus luteum and keeps progesterone levels high. It also secretes estrogen and human placental lactinogen, which helps prepare the breasts for milk production and adjust maternal metabolism to support fetal growth. The placental hormone's role is essential for sustaining pregnancy until birth. The pancreas is a dual function organ that lies beneath the stomach, stretching across the abdomen. It has both exocrine and endocrine functions. The exocrine portion produces digestive enzymes, while the endocrine portion, the pancreatic islets, regulates blood glucose levels. These islets are clusters of hormone secreting cells scattered throughout the pancreas, surrounded by a rich blood supply, so hormones can reach the targets quickly. Within each pancreatic islet are four main types of cells. Alpha cells secrete glucagon, which raises blood glucose levels. Beta cells secrete insulin, which lowers blood glucose levels. Delta cells release somatostatin, which helps regulate both insulin and glucagon, as well as PP cells secrete pancreatic polypeptides, which influences appetite and digestive secretion. Together, these cells act like team maintaining glucose balance. Insulin and glucose are opposing but cooperative forces. After a meal, blood glucose rises, triggering beta cells to release insulin. Insulin allows cells to absorb glucose and store it in the glycogen for fat. When you haven't eaten for a while, blood glucose levels drop and alpha cells release glucagon to promote to prompt the liver to release stored glucose. These two hormones create a constant push and pull to keep blood glucose within a narrow range roughly 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. Beyond the classic glands, several organs that don't really typically think of endocrine actually secrete hormones. These include the heart, kidneys, digestive organs, bones, adipose tissue, skin, thymus, as well as the liver. 
Each contributes to the body's internal communication network, regulating everything from blood pressure and calcium levels to appetite and metabolism. The heart produces atrial natriuretic peptide, or ANP. When its chambers stretch from increased blood volume, ANP helps reduce that volume by decreasing sodium reabsorption in the kidneys and relaxing blood pressure, blood vessels. Meanwhile, the gastrointestinal tract releases several hormones like gastrin, secretin, cholecystokinin, or CCK that coordinate digestion. These hormones regulate stomach acid, pancreatic secretion, and bile release, keeping the digestive process smooth and efficient. The kidneys are more than just filters, they're endocrine organs too. They release renin when the blood pressure drops, activating the renin angiotensin aldosterone system to restore pressure and volume. These produce erythropoietin or EPO, which stimulates red blood cell production in response to low oxygen levels. Finally, they convert vitamin D into the active form, calcitriol, which promotes calcium reabsorption. Bone is more than structures, it's also metabolically active. Certain bone cells release fibroblasts, growth factor 23, which lowers phosphate levels and limits calcitriol production in the kidneys. Osteoplasts produce oxocalcinin, a hormone that enhances insulin production and improves glucose use by the tissues. Adipose tissue acts like hormonal control centers. Fat cells release leptin, which signals fullness to the brain and helps regulate body weight. They also secrete adiponectin, which is a hormone that improves insulin sensitivity and protects blood vessels from inflammation. When we gain or lose fat, hormone levels shift, influencing appetite and metabolism. The skin helps start vitamin D synthesis by producing cholecalciferol, which when exposed to sunlight. That compound is later converted in the liver and kidneys to calcitriol, which boasts calcium absorption and supports immune health. The thymus, active mainly in childhood, protects thymosin that guides T-cell development. Even though it shrinks with age, its early role in shaping immune immunity is crucial. The liver is one of the most versatile organs in the body, and its endocrine function often goes unnoticed. It produces insulin-like growth factor 1, or IGF-1, which helps stimulate bone and muscle growth under the influence of growth hormone. It also makes angiotensinogen the starting molecule for the RAAS system that helps control blood pressure. Thrombopoietin from the liver promotes platelet production and hepcidin regulates iron balance by controlling when iron is released from storage. In short, the liver quietly supports growth, metabolism, and oxygen transport. When we look at the endocrine system as a whole, it's a remarkable how it maintains harmony through chemistry. Every hormone we discuss, from insulin to cortisol to, me to melatonin and estrogen, works in sync with others to keep the body's internal environment stable. The endocrine and nervous systems are constant partners, one providing faster responses, the other ensuring long-term balance. Even small chemical signals can have sweeping effects on mood, metabolism, and growth. As we move forward, keep in mind that the endocrine system and endocrine health underlies everything from daily energy to stress resilience.